Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Town Steel number MSS-L-08T in a 32D finish, sectional low rose style, single cylinder front door corridor front function, heavy duty mortise lock with tango lever, satin stainless steel. So this video is gonna serve as visual review of this Town Steel mortise lock. We're gonna go over the individual parts. We are going to talk about the installation instructions and the template. And let's start with a, a review of the series of the lock in terms of what it is that we're dealing with. So this is an MS uh, series mortise lock. The MS locks are designed for high traffic, commercial areas, schools, universities, office buildings, industrial complexes. 40 types of trim combinations available in eight uh, different finishes. Um, they do have a lot of trim designs and we'll get to that catalog as well. This is a grade one lock set. It is UL and ULC listed for three hour applications. This is, an, this is a single cylinder function the trim uh, again it's going to be their tango lever with their low rows trim which means it's basically 7 16ths of an inch very short projection off the face of the door a variety of links are down below here as well that we're going to go through um, an image of the item additional product information that all comes out of the product catalog and let's move forward with just reviewing the contents of the box as it here is in front of us. Okay, so one box is gonna have the trim. That's what your Tango lever looks like. That is a tubular lever with a return back to the face. It's tubular in the sense that it is round. It's like a tube, but it's also tubular in the sense that this is hollow. So tubular, um, it's a Tango lever that's tubular. Um, is what this one is, okay? The springs that are inside of there seem to return the lever back to horizontal very well without trouble. It's rose. There's a couple of roses in here. There it is. Yeah, that is quite small. There's no doubt. No doubt about that at all. After you get that installed, you're going to... That will snap into place. It's very nice sort of fit and finish that they have there. It's a nice look as well. Nice margin. Okay, quite attractive. There's no question about that. Yeah, both roses were in one box. Let's take a look at the other box of this, um, of this trim. It ought to have, of course, the exterior side in it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it has, it, it certainly has uh, another lever. And it has other parts as well. It's going to have all of its fasteners for attaching everything to the, to the door. I'm going to put those aside. It has its strike plate. Okay, we're going to go over that as well shortly. We'll go over that when we get to the installation aspect. A dust box, that is uh, very handy to have. A collar, a tapered solid collar for its cylinder, and the cylinder is up next as well. A six pin cylinder made of solid brass with the appropriate cam on the back. This lock is in a Schlage C keyway, classic C keyway, six pin. Factory original look alike key blanks are here. Stainless steel finish on the front. I bet that's probably an inch and a quarter mortise cylinder. It looks a little bit long. Uh, yeah, they would call that inch and a quarter, is what that would be called even though it's a bit shy an inch and a quarter. But it's the proper length for this lock set is the bottom line. 
Now, moving into the rest of the lock bo uh, rest of the box, certainly we're going to get into the lock body in a moment, and we're going to talk about the functions. There is one other box. Thumb turn, maybe? Yeah, of course. There's your thumb turn on the inside. So obviously this function, corridor, front door, is going to have a uh, the ability to throw the deadbolt and retract the deadbolt. And we're going to, again, go over the functions. Lots of documentation on the inside in terms of installation, which we're going to touch on as well. Its armor front is here, which we'll talk about. Okay, the mortise cassette or lock case, lock body. Cassette is how I originally saw them referred to. Well, that seems nice. My first impression is that that is heavy. Um, you know, weight does, of course, seem to infer to us uh, quality. That's, of course, not the case. Something made of cast iron is heavy, but may not be good. Uh, here's your lock body. This will adjust for a bevel on the door. You'll loosen that screw, and the one down here, it's set. You know, what appears to be a square edge door, you'll loosen that so the faceplate can be askew, your three degree. Obviously, you're prepped for your cylinder here, your thumb turns, your hubs for your operating trim. There's nothing down here. If there was, there might be a thumb grip where a lever comes and lifts this up. It is prepped for that, but there are no, uh, there is not, this, cause this lock body isn't prepped to handle that sort of function. Stop works are here. That's what those buttons are called. So this is going to give you a bolt. Okay. It's going to give you a deadlocking latch at the bottom. It's going to give you your stop works. The stop works, really what they do is serve to lock the trim, is what it really does. As those two pieces move in and out, they are basically locking the hubs from turning. So when this top plate moves in, it basically fits into that hub, preventing it from rotating is how that is how that works. Yeah, nice quality. It, it appears to be nice quality. Um, it is labeled. It bears visual evidence of its compliance with a fire test, which is required uh, for use on fire rated doors, there's no doubt. Then the other thing that we just touched on was its armor front, and that armor front covers the edge of the door. Your dead bolt, your dead latch, and then your stop works, or your push buttons on the side. They're called stop works. Now, uh, let's take a look at the paperwork that's here and familiarize ourselves with what else is included in the box. Um, <clears throat> I expect this to be a simple lock to install. Yeah, uh, and, and of course it is. You know, the world of mortise locks are, are, you know, there's such great engineering involved in them where where their assembly kind of becomes, okay, look at the parts. It, it, they're almost self-explanatory, which is a, a, an incredible feat of, of hardware that's incredibly complicated to begin with. Um, instructions are on here on how to change the handing of the lock. Then exploded parts diagram showing sectional trim down here and escutcheon trim here. So that's really everything that's there. Okay, your steps down here in the corner, an exploded drawing of the lock itself showing how it all goes together. Then of course your template, this is going to be a full size template and Uh, its difference is uh, the fact that this is for this side is um, for left hand or left hand reverse doors, I guess. And this, you know, so this would this would work on doors swinging this way or this way. The other side is going to work on doors that operate in the opposite fashion. Okay, and we're going to go over the template as well. Uh, talk about how to drill the holes, how to prep everything, and make all of those uh, preparations uh, for you. Let's start with the uh, links down below this video 
of the how to order the template. We're going to walk through all of the paperwork next. Let's start with how to order. Um, that would be the first document there. And as a result of going through all of this, all of these uh, links that are below, it's going to familiarize. It'll serve to familiarize ourselves with the lock. So you literally build the lock part number by following this example. And they've given, a, given it to us there uh, pretty clearly. Uh, so you're going to have your you're going to have your series of lock and it's going to tell them um, how the lock has to be prepped to receive your ultimate requirements. So the series would come first. That will depend on what you're doing with doing in terms of your trim, sectional or discussion, and then what type of um, you know um, rows uh, actually is what they're talking about, rows or discussion. All of that is dependent on how thick that material is. So step two is the function of the lock. Yeah, that makes sense. There's lots of functions. Then your trim design in terms of your lever and your finish. Um, the handing is important to know, even though the lock can be reversed or field handed, and we'll go over that as well. Um, they, there is a reference there in step six to lead lined. These locks can be ordered lead lined. Um, if you were working on a door that was of lead-lined construction, then you can talk about an interchangeable core option that's there. So that document is fairly generic, and we're going to move now to the uh, functions that will permit us to have an overview understanding of the different functions. So there are four pages of documents that are there. We are dealing with an 08 function. You scroll down to almost the bottom of page one and you see the front door or corridor lock. So in the first column is a side view of what the lock looks like. And that's important because it will show you where, if any cylinders occur, where if any thumb turns occur, and what the edge of the lock prep looks like uh, in terms of what's sticking out of it. Dead bolts, dead latches, stop works, auxiliary uh, deadlocking portions as well. So the next column over, and it, it, that cross section or that side view is outside inside, then they give you the function number that you'll need. Okay, your 01, your 02, 04 function, etc. Okay, so what they've done in series function, they've already built for you steps one and two of the how to order chart. The next column is type. It's what we would speak of or title the, the function of the lock using plain language. Okay, just plain language. Uh, we're doing a front door or corridor. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The next column over is the ANSI number, the ANSI number, American National Standards Institute. Every major manufacturer of lock sets will have their hardware tested by ANSI to make sure that it meets the criteria set forth. Um, it's like making pizzas and then not providing delivery service. They kind of go hand in hand. To manufacture lock sets and to have them tested by ANSI, that goes hand in hand, that goes together. The nice thing about the ANSI column is if you're working on a project and your project calls out F04, F, different F series numbers, you can take that and then correlate that back to this chart where if someone's asking you for an F02, okay, that's a privacy or a bedroom. The 08 function we're dealing with happens to be an F08, and you'll kind of notice that what... Um, Town Steel has done is they've used the F function as their function number and certainly someone like Town Steel would absolutely do that because um, speaking plainly they're not a major manufacturer of lock sets. They might be major but they're not the names that roll off the tongue in commercial construction. If you are a owner an architect, a contractor, a subcontractor, a distributor, anyone, and you're saying, yeah, my lock package is going to cost me X thousands of dollars. How do I save some money? 
it makes finding the part number awfully handy if you already know the function, the F, the ANSI number. Okay, and Townsteel's approach has made it even easier. You already know their function because it's the same as the ANSI function, which is why I would guess they do that. The last column is the description, the operational description. Operational description is the term that's used to basically say, in plain, straightforward, elegant language, explain it to me. Using words not said twice. Um, and the crafting of operational descriptions is crucial to conveying what you expect from other people or what's going to happen. And a client might say, I need an electric lock with a request to exit switch. I need, I need a lock with a request to exit switch. I need to have a magnetic lock. I need to have a key switch. I need to have a keypad on the outside. I need to have a power supply. I need to have a door position switch and an enunciator. So that's an extreme, a relatively extreme example of write in plain language an operational description that tells me how all of that works. With lock sets, it's less complicated, and in particular, the passage is the easiest to look at. Latch bolt operated by lever, or it should say by lever or knob. I assume they make knob trim. From either side at all times. Very clear what happens. Nothing else is said. Does it have a cylinder? Well, did they say anything about a cylinder? No, there's no cylinder. So it's very simple in that regard. L interpret literally the words, and that's everything, everything that you're getting. Nothing will occur in the function of the lock itself that is not expressed in the operational description. Um, they're interesting to read because I, when I first started in the, in the door hardware business, I read operational descriptions like that and I thought, boy, they are really elegant how they put that together. So let's move to the 08. This is going to have a key on the outside, a thumb turn on the inside. We're going to have a bolt in the edge of the door. We're going to have our latch bolt and our stop works. Latch bolt operated by lever from either side, except when the outside lever is made inoperative by the push button rocker or stop works. So you can come and go as you please, provided that you've not pushed the button in the edge of the lock. Deadbolt is operated by the turn on the inside. All right, so that should say deadbolt is operated by cylinder on the outside or thumb turn on the inside because I can with that cylinder I can throw and retract the latch bolt there's no doubt oh okay so they uh, forgive me the next line very elegantly key outside operates both bolts that's that is indeed a very elegant way to put that the key is going to not only allow me to retract the latch but to throw the bolt as well so that is quite elegant um, So what's interesting here, and what I was driving at saying, something very interesting is it's latch bolt operated by lever from either side, except when outside lever is made inoperative by a push button rocker. Okay, so absorbing that basically tells us that I can, I can, I can operate the latch bolt except when the outside lever is made inoperative by the rocker buttons. Okay, So this is a right hand lock. This is the outside of the door. I have a spindle set here in my trim. And let's just see what its function is. Turn it so you can see it. Does not turn. I push the rocker. It now retracts. Okay. If I were to throw that deadbolt, notice what happens here. We're unlocked. I know that this is going to turn. Okay. Watch my stop works. When I throw the deadbolt, and my finger is just acting as the cam. When I throw the deadbolt, 
See how that locks? It now renders the outside locked. Okay. The outside is now locked. If you were to simply retract the latch bolt on the inside, I'm still locked down here. Okay. Locking and unlocking the latch bolt does not, uh, the deadbolt does not unlock me on the outside. Okay. So the only way to set the lock unlocked from the exterior is to push that button on the inside. So we're locked on the outside, that we know. The inside tells us we're always free to exit. When I throw the deadbolt and it throws the stop works, we know that. We are still locked on the inside, okay? Until the deadbolt is thrown back, then I'm free to operate. What I'm driving at with this is it's unusual to buy a front door or corridor lock because it does not permit free egress. And that's why <laughs> um, That's why Bear with me. Look at the O4 function, the entry office function. It will say when outside lever is locked, and you can lock it by throwing the deadbolt which affects the stop works. Latch bolt is retracted by key from the outside or by operating the inside lever. What that means is you can always exit. What's unusual about a front door or a corridor lock is that's not the case. You have to manually retract the latch bolt, the deadbolt, in order to have free operation, but you're still locked on the outside. This will always stay locked unless you intentionally unlock it via the stop works. It will stay unlocked until you throw the deadbolt. That will render the outside trim unlocked, rigid. That will throw the stop works. That will also prevent exit as well. So that's what you have to be most mindful for because that's what people don't plan on. Um, there was a time where emergency egress on locks was not as severely required as it is today. Getting out in an emergency with a single action is uh, so severely steeped in building code that it's typical and common. Someone using this this function of lock, it has to be residential because the code does permit um, two operations. One, two is the bottom line on how that's going to work. Okay, so the functions are there and they're relatively easy to review. I would, I'll tell you this, you've got five common functions. Passage, O1. Privacy, O2. Uh, entry or entry office, O4. Classroom, O5. And storeroom, or O7. Those are the five. The classroom's even not that common. So passage, privacy, entry, and then storeroom, sometimes classroom. If you're getting outside of that and you're not sure what you're buying, study those uh, operational descriptions because... Um, Getting a lock that you realize, oh my gosh, I can't just have one single operation to exit is not what I want. So be mindful to read those um, operational descriptions. Now, moving forward into the handing area, my favorite, uh, it does talk about how to hand the door. It talks about how doors are handed. Doors are handed four ways, four ways, uh, left hand or right hand or left hand reverse, right hand reverse. If it is left hand or right hand, and there's no words after that, the door inherently swings in. The secure side of the door is the push side of the door. It's that simple. If you have a door that's left hand reverse or right hand reverse, that inherently means the door swings out and that the secure side of the door is on the pull side. Why is that important? Well, if you have an exit device, you would never call it left hand reverse or right hand reverse because those doors always swing out. But it's really important is if you are ordering doors and frames and you want them prepped correctly, 
perfect example is this lock. Um, you can understand that I've got an asymmetrical prep. I've got a cylinder on one side. I've got a thumb turn on the other side. Okay, The cylinder doesn't go through the door. The thumb turn doesn't go through the door. So you have to understand what is the secure side of the door. That's the side the cylinder needs to go on. What's the, what's the opposite side of the door? Well, that's where the thumb turn will go. So the point is, understanding how doors swing in terms of how we communicate that information in a commercial setting, commercial locks, is utterly crucial because you're going to get into a situation where you'll put the cylinder on the wrong side of the door. And as a result, what we're driving at, the handing is important for that reason. Uh, it might also be important if you're ordering, if you, if you order a right-hand door, with a door closer, a steel door and a frame, we know where we're going to put the reinforcement for the steel. It'll be on the pull side because you ordered a right hand. But if you ordered a left hand reverse, then we would realize, oh, the reinforcement needs to be on the push side. So everything is based on understanding the, the terminology of how, it, um, of how the handing of a door works. However you get it correct is, is all good for us. Um, there is a template installation guide and product brochure. We're going to jump to the installation guide right now. That's because it dovetails with our conversation on handing. So you can reverse this lock. If you found out, oh gosh, it's not a right hand that I need. I need something completely different. Um, I need a... Um, a lock that has trim that can be affected differently um, will need to be rehanded. The side of the cylinder that you put it on may is going to require rehanding most likely. Uh, sure. So the bottom line is there are two things that you have to think about when you're rehanding a mortise lock. First is the orientation of the latch bolt. Okay, if you're going to take this lock and you're going to turn it from a uh, right hand lock and it's now going to become a left hand reverse lock, left hand reverse swings this way, you're on the outside, right hand door swings this way, you're on the outside. That latch bolt doesn't need to be flipped around, it works. It works either way. But a right hand cannot be turned into a left hand because you can't do that, okay? Um, so the latch in half of the instances will need to be reversed. The other half of the possibilities of the four handings, the hubs or the stop works need to be considered because on this lock, as we demonstrated earlier, I can fix the outside trim. Well, if you have a right-hand door and this is the outside, okay, and you're going to convert that to a left hand, you'll need to flip the latch bolt over. You're going to convert a right hand to a left hand. You're going to have to convert the latch bolt and the stop works. If you're going to convert a right hand to a left hand reverse, the latch bolt will stay. But now, what was the outside is now the inside. So now you've, you're rigid on here when you throw the deadbolt. Well, you're rigid there anyway, but you're rigid there at all times until you've got the key. You need the key to exit. So the installation instructions are listed there for us to talk about how we're going to hand this door. And I'm looking through the part. Yep, they do. They Step one, remove special screw with provided Allen wrench. So if you need to effect change on the latch bolt, you're going to certainly need the, uh, the Allen wrench. But before you really start to decide on what you're going to change, you know, determine. Determine first, is this the correct orientation? If it's not, just flip it over. Okay. Then like I demonstrated earlier with the parts on my desk, do a reality check. Does the inside operate the way it's supposed to? Does the outside operate the way it's supposed to? If it doesn't, well, then you've got to change the orientation of the hubs that are here, okay? So the latch bolt, per the installation instruction, there's no screw there, but that's where the screw is, right there. So at this point, I'm going to 
get that in there. Now I'm going to rotate it, but I'm holding the latch bolt with my fingers. Remove the special screw. They're saying to remove it, not loosen it. One thing that might be advantageous is to work on a rubber mat or over a surface that you're not concerned about parts being becoming lost. These are specialty pieces. Pull latch bolt out of lock. That indeed does just come out. Okay. If I'm going to convert it, I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to stick it back in. And you really can't get this wrong because there's really only one way for it to go in. except that I've already made a mistake. So that little elbow needs to be held in, and when you put it in, it needs to go inside of the chassis. Let's do it this way. Okay, now you're gonna have proper operation. Sorry, I was doing that all down below the screen. That elbow's got to be folded back, right there. Then at this point, you're just going to tighten your screw. Now you've reversed the latch bolt. What was once a left hand or a right hand or a left hand reverse is now a left hand or a right hand reverse. I'm going to put this back the way it was because it does need to go to the client as a right hand. Trust me, I'm an expert. <laughs> Put that screw back in there. There's some thread lock that's on there. That's certainly a good thing. Save all the, uh, the spare parts. You never know when you'll need to work on a town steel lock. I don't think they're the only lock manufacturer that has this sort of situation on their latch bolt. I know that I've, I know that I've handed other people's latch bolts the same way. So now we know what we're doing in terms of the latch bolt. We've got that figured out perfectly. That's steps one and two. Now if we're going to move forward to step three, it does say there, make sure foot is under the under latch surface, the problem that I had. Cannot put the lock back with the foot, or the elbow I called it, or the horn, above the latch surface. Rotate you're in business. Now, we're going to the right side of the page. Change the locking slide position. That's super easy. All you have to do is move these two screws out and put them to the other side. Let's take a look at that closely. Okay, now we had demonstrated how the exterior side is unlocked until I push the stop works. And now it's rigid. And on the inside, I'm unlocked, push the stop works, I'm unlocked. So you get the idea. The unlock side has these two screws and basically all it says is remove them, turn the lock over to the opposite side and reinstall the screws as shown. To ensure locking slide does not bind, manually push to the desired side or alternate tightening every other screw two or three turns. Um, there are moving parts on the inside of here. And I'm just going to place this down. You won't be able to see it. Um, there are moving parts on the inside of here that need to get handled correctly. Uh, meaning, you know, handling them correctly means don't over tighten anything. Now, with that screw removed, no, we recall that the inside had the two screws, and this was always unlocked. Well, if I were to put the two screws on the opposite side, this lock would become a left-hand reverse. Let's test that. I like to make sure that the stuff works before I, you know, show up to the job with my tools and a client standing there watching everything that I do. <laughs> um, 
going in evenly as the manufacturer's installation instructions uh, called out, I my curiosity won't get the better of me, causing me to remove the lock case from the door. So I won't. I'm not going to do that. So now this needs to be the inside. You're on the inside. The door has to swing out this way because of the orientation of the latch bolt. This should be always unlocked right now. It's unlocked. I'm going to hit the stop works. It's unlocked. Now the ultimate test. From the outside, it's locked. Hit the stop works. It's unlocked. We know that we're rock solid in that regard. Now we're going to move on and look at the product brochure next. Okay, now we're going to take a look at that product catalog, product brochure, and that is a really great document because it allows you to um, dive into the different types of trim options, really. It's obviously going to be an overview document of all of the, all of the different designs. We're going to touch on the variations in terms of not only levers and their rows and escutcheon sets, but also optional things like thumb turns. Uh, there is a knob that's listed there as well uh, in their catalog. Their functions are listed there. So it's a relatively concise uh, document. And um, I, I really think it's to be noted that when they say that they have so many different options, 40 types of trim combinations. Yeah, that's true. Um, but when you look at the levers and knobs, they have a total of eight, seven levers and a knob. Um, then they get into sectional and escutcheon. They get into the different roses that they have, uh, the different escutcheons that they have, which there would be two. Um, you know, it's it, they come up to 40 because of the combinations they can put together. Now looking at the levers, we are dealing with the tango lever which we see here and the dimensions are listed on the catalog okay or in the catalog the other common levers that i think that you could expect to encounter is certainly going to be the sentinel that's going to be the generic commercial lever the quest shape is going to be somewhat common that imperial you'll see the gala you'll see as well i've never seen the artistic um i've never seen the congress and the regal knob I've never seen, but you know that's probably just because of how knobs are not really permissible at uh, any at ADA compliant application would not permit, of course, the knob to be there. Um, you do then have to decide if you know what trim you've got. Are you doing sectional trim or escutcheon trim? And then from there, which of those options would you go with? I do like that low profile rose a lot. And I'll tell you, I think that's the one that we sell the most of. If you're dealing with upgrading or changing a lock, you might need to consider escutcheon trim because at the end of the day, escutcheon trim can assist you in covering up old holes that will not be utilized when you install a new lock body. So a lot of locksmiths with their clients will get into, okay, well, you know, we, we're not replacing the door. We've got all these extra holes that we're not going to need. We need to go with an escutcheon trim. So very commonly you'll see that as well. Those optional thumb turns that are there are nice. Um, standard thumb turn. Um, what's nice about, well, this is just the typical thumb turn, the standard with the two exposed holes. They have that optional thumb turn where you will conceal the fasteners that are here. That's nice. Um, and then you have the ADA compliant thumb turn. And that might be something necessary for you to consider as well. Uh, and be mindful of that. If you, um, you know, if you're going to be putting a privacy set onto a door in a bathroom, Yes, you, you have to have the, you know, in a, in a commercial setting, you have to have the ADA compliant thumb turn, so be mindful of that. 
and that is listed there. Then again, the levers and knobs, uh, the how to order. The finishes now are also mentioned. US 3 or 605 polished brass, US 4 606 satin brass, US 10B 613 oil rub bronze, US 15 619 satin nickel, US 26 625 bright chrome or polished chrome, uh, US 2060 or 626 satin chrome, um, US 32, 629 bright polished stainless, US 32D or 630 satin stainless steel. This lock we are doing in the 630 finish. So this is going to be exactly what stainless steel looks like. We'll match, you know, um, it's going to be a good option for exterior applications. Okay. That's that armor, armor front again. Let's take a closer look at that before we move on. It's precisely what it's going to look like. Okay. Obviously, they have different armor fronts for different functions. Some functions you don't require the stop works or this. You might have a deadlocking tab down here. Whatever, the, whatever might be required, the armor front will be made to incorporate uh, the design or the function of the lock that you're using. Now, armor front, the term, I've seen the, I've seen armor front, the term used in old catalogs, several decades old, World War I era, where they would have two options of mortise locks. They would have a mortise lock body where the piece here was about a quarter inch thick. That was the exposed size. That was, or the exposed side. We inserted that body into the cavity of the door. That's what it was. And if you ever encounter a mortise lock from the 1920s, it's probably going to be what it is. There is no armor front. Um, so in that same catalog, they then have the same model available with an armor front. That original piece of equipment is about half the thickness naturally. That armor front is two ply. There's another layer outside of there. And I think the advantage of having an armor front would be, obviously you can do decorative finishes. Pardon me, you can do, you can specify the finish that you want on a scalp plate or an armor front. But then you also uh, are able to elegantly conceal the exposed portion here. Without an armor front, you're not going to be able to conceal those set screws that are down there that are going to be what hold the cylinder in the lock body without it turning. Okay, You'll be able to guide the stopworks buttons as well. I don't know if an armor front meant that the applied material being two-ply, if the exterior portion was more substantial than the interior portion, but my guess is that it probably was. I don't know what the K, what that portion of an old mortise lock body would be made of, but imagine if it was cast iron. That's not a very durable material in the sense of drilling through it um, or somehow maybe manipulating it. There could have been a design reason why they would say, okay, we can sell you the regular mortise lock or we can give you this one here with an armor front that's heavier duty, so to speak. So that may be the case. I've not, I've not solved that mystery um, regarding that yet, but I will at some point, I suppose. Then moving through the product catalog further, they get literally to the functions of which we've covered all of those. Now, looking at the template and installation guide. Let's go to the template next. We're going to talk about how to prep that door. Um, so we've seen in our paperwork a whole lot of stuff. Okay. This template is actually not really uh, intimidating at all. Um, you do kind of need you do need to to look at both sides in order to be able to make a um, proper movement forward to prep your door um, and frame. The if you would please look at page one on your screen, and I'll and I'll do so as well. <clears throat> the most important thing to start off with is looking at the strike on the right hand side. The most important thing to be aware of is the relocation of the set of the center line. Mortise locks require the relocation of a center line in relationship to the strike plate because this strike is a standardized four and seven eighths of an inch tall strike. Okay, this height 
four and seven eighths is a standard. Hollow metal frames are going to be made for this size. Okay. In order to fit everything into the strike body, they literally need to take that lock case. If it was a, if if the center line of the strike and the center line of a cylindrical lock was the same center line. If you operated on that principle, you would find that you wouldn't be able to fit everything into the strike. So they literally take the case and they drop it down 3 eighths of an inch, and at that point you can fit everything in. And that's exactly why there's a relocation to the center light, to the center line dimension. Um, that has to be understood when you're prepping the door and frame. Um, you can see it clearly there. It clearly states center line of strike and center line of lock, but the reasoning behind it is what we just explained so that you can understand it. Once you understand it, you say to yourself, oh, okay, I'm, I'm in good shape there. I understand what has to happen. Um, so using just numbers in my head, if the underside of the header to the center line of the strike is 43 and 11 sixteenths, your lock preparation needs to be 43 and 15 sixteenths center line. Okay, so when you put your tape measure on the door, you'll drop it down to 43 and 15 sixteenths, and that's your center line. And in fact, that center line is indeed 3 eighths lower than the center line of a cylindrical lock because a, cylindr a cylindrical lock does not require a relocation of the center line. Why is that important? Well, when you look at the template, you have to say to yourself, well, I've got to start drilling holes. Where in the heck am I going to put them? Well, that's where knowing this dimension is crucial. Um, knowing this dimension, your back set, that's easy. It's two and three quarter for this lock. There are mortise locks available in a variety of back sets. Inch and a half, two inch, two and a half inch, two and three quarter. There are certainly those that are bigger than that. Um, two and a half, two and three quarter, those are relatively common. Two inch is not unheard of at all. Um, two and three quarter, of course, is the most common, but don't you know, don't assume that it's two and three quarter. You, you know, it's called out on the template. So now at this point, we know if you're going to draw a couple of lines on your door, you know the center line, the vertical height. You now know how far everything is, right? From that zero point, you're going to be able to now determine where you lay out all your function holes. What I find the most important thing to do at that point is to have an understanding of the function of the lock that I'm working on, meaning where do I expect the hole for the thumb turn to be? Where do I expect the hole for the cylinder to be? Knowing that, what side of the door am I supposed to be prepping it on? Because when you look at the template, it, it you know, unless you're really studying it or very familiar with templates, it may be unclear to you that this hole does not go all the way through or this hole does not go all, or does go all the way through. They do a good job with the trim uh, that they have there in terms of showing you um, what's supposed to be drilled. Okay. You know, these, these holes for the screws have to go through. I don't know what that hole is. I don't know why there are three of them. We're going to study why that's the case. Um, but then you can see when you look above there for the half inch hole that's marked thumb turn hole IS inside or inch and a quarter hole for the mortise cylinder OS for outside. It's really important to know that you're only drilling that hole through the door into the cavity of the mortise pocket. Let's talk about the mortise pocket. Super easy to understand. It's eight inch tall. It's inch and a quarter wide. I think it's th I think the depth is um, of the of the armor front itself is 932nd of an inch. Let's see if we can find that on the template. I don't see that they give you the dimension. They say recess to fit the plate. So what I'm talking about is how deep you're going to mortise all of this. Okay. And I am thinking that's 932nd of an inch. My caliper is telling me 0 0.254, 0 0.254 inch. So yeah, 932nd. That would, that would be, I guess my memory is good, just heavy on a quarter inch. Um, so eight inch tall, inch and a quarter wide, 932nd of an inch 
deep. Then you would have your mortise pocket, which needs to be six and five eighths tall, eight, one inch wide, and then four and a half inch deep. Well, the first time that I did a mortise lock pocket, let me tell you about that. What I did, and what a lot of people do when they're when they're new to prepping for a mortise lock, or you're literally only going to do one, um, you really want to have a router to do everything with woodworking. It's other than the caliper, I think the, the router is the carpenter's best friend, or the trim carpenter's best friend. Um, it's one inch wide, right? And we're going to assume that it's a half inch radius. The first one I did, I literally took my fly bit and drilled a whole lot of holes down into that door. Okay, Took my chisel and cleaned it all out, and it worked when it was done. It, it looked like a butcher job, but it, it, it worked very well. It was you know, clinically acceptable, uh, not a problem. So you can certainly prep that that way. You know, then you've got 930 seconds by eight by inch and a quarter. They make a tool for doing this. Porter Cable does. Um, we do technically sell those. And it's basically a router that clamps to the edge of the door that has a handle. And as you rotate the handle, it forces the motor to travel on its slides to the height that you've prescribed. You can set the depth so that it will tell you when you are at the proper depth. Okay, The bit that you put in there is going to be the right size bit. That's really awesome because you can clamp it onto the door, find your center line of the tool, match that to the center line of your lock, and then it's just literally maybe 90 seconds of turning the handle. The downside of that tool is Prepping mineral core doors is havoc on tools. That gypsum, that mineral core, destroys all tools sooner or later. Um, what we would do in the shop is we would literally have someone with a shop vac standing at the door, sucking that in as the door is prepped. Um, we've had CNC equipment do it as well. Of course, having the presence of dust collection is mandatory, otherwise the tool will not even start up. So if it's wood, not a big deal, although you're going to make a ton of wood chips as you're running the tool, it's going to go everywhere. I wouldn't even consider doing it in an environment where um, you could not suffer that sort of mess. It's a tremendous amount that's going to get everywhere. Uh, don't do it at your client's front porch, by all means. Um, prep that shop vac if you can um, and have it collected. If you're doing it by hand in your shop, it's not going to be the end of the world. Then doing your faceplate, your eight by inch and a quarter by nine thirty seconds. Um, that's just a template, you know, with a proper bit. That's easy, easy work to do. Okay, so your your pocket is easy. Now back to your function holes. When you do your function holes, when you're drilling through the door, you're drilling through the door, but don't drill through the door. Drill from both sides because as you've you've made your pocket Unless you're going to drill your function holes first, I always made the pocket first um, because I'm always marking my holes on either side of the door. I'm not drilling through the door. That's very unusual to do. Um, if it's a, sometimes, but, but mortise locks require very good placement of function holes. Otherwise, the lock does not work correctly. It doesn't fit properly. So... When you're drilling your cylinder hole or your thumb turn hole, you're really only drilling to the cavity at that point. Okay. Um, <laughs> as you're prepping the door with the pocket, all that particle board or whatever is coming out fiercely. I'm thinking of having function holes drilled, and now it's coming out this way as well. Um, might be an advantage to doing the uh, pocket first. We've talked about this. We've talked about this. Now it's time for you to lay out the holes. Having a reality check, having an understanding of what function of lock you're working on is crucial. At that point, you're going to lay out the holes that you're going to want to have uh, in the door for you. So the page two on the left side is going to show you what holes you're supposed to drill. We're doing an 08 function here. So we are going to be over on the on the outside. We're doing the lever hole. We're doing the cylinder hole. 
On the inside, we're doing the lever hole and we're doing the thumb turn. When you take those definitions and then you translate that to your um, to your layout, you're going to very easily see I'm doing my cylinder hole and my lever hole on the outside. Okay, so the the knob or lever hole in our case will be on both sides the cylinder holes on the outside only the thumb turn holes on the inside only the through bolt holes they don't have a, a column for that drill only if you have a knob or lever on this side of the door now you can get a function that is a one-sided trim only where you're not going to have it could be it could literally be an exit lock where there's a lever on the inside there's a mortise case and on the exterior of the door it's utterly blank that would be an exit lock you're not going to have trim on the outside so you'll drill the through bolt holes through the door in all instances except when you literally don't have trim on that side so it's it really follows the same rules of what you're already working with what i like to do is after i've determined correctly where my holes are um, You'll notice that the through bolt holes are either at, you know, 130 and 630 or they're, you know, at 1030 and 430, whatever you want to call that, where they're located. That's going to be dependent on what side of the door that you're on. But they do go through the door indeed. So this is a right hand door. Okay, you're going to notice that the holes are opposite of each other, okay? So you have an inside trim and an outside trim. You have one of each is the important part, and because they are, these are made or assembled as a left hand and a right hand, you do literally have one of each. Um, so you'll observe your template and you're going to, you know, again, do a reality check. When we're looking at, in our case here, when we're looking at page one, that the way that that is laid out, okay, it does exactly look like this. So making sure that you're drilling the through bolt holes in the proper location is, of course, crucial. If you happen to get it wrong, it's not the end of the world because the rows or the discussion will cover that. You'll just have extra holes. Now, what's not clear to me is what that other third hole is that's not that hole that's down here. I don't know what that's for, and I expect that we will discover what it's for when we go into the installation instructions. Okay, so that's... You, you, this horizontal vertical we're good we've talked about what holes to drill where what I simply do at that point is I mark them off with my tape measure I will then double check everything regardless of how many times you know you're right double check it then I would take my center punch and I would make quick work of just center punching my holes then I would have my drill bit and I would just drill because you're drilling only halfway through the door you can just do it standing there or drilling in a vertical like maybe a drill press type of orientation if you were using that so if you're drilling through the door i said that earlier that that's not a good idea because you've got the pocket there that drill bit is not going to hit solid wood and is very is certainly going to not drill through the door correct and that's where people have a heck of a time getting mortise locks to fit correctly because they've tried to drill straight through the door now speaking of that it's also really important to understand the concept of back set back set here is two and three quarter we talked about the other uh, options as well. Now there's something very interesting on this template on the upper left hand area between the mortise case and the edge of the lock that says high bevel, flat no bevel, and low bevel. That concept needs to be discussed thoroughly 
in order to get it correct because mortise lock function holes are very particular, meaning there's very low tolerance for having your holes off and not in the correct position. Let's talk about exactly what all of that means. Looking at the bevel question, basically what we're dealing with here is needing to understand how back set is defined. So the short version is it's the edge of the door to the center of the hole. That's your back set. But you need to define edge of door. So here is an example of back set. Not drawn very well, I apologize, but here are some examples of doors. Beveled edge, square edge, radius, and rabbited. Okay, so the question is, where do you measure from? Where do I put my tape measure? Um, and it's a very valid question. Um, if you don't know, you don't know. However, the door hardware industry really makes life easy because they've, it's, it's, it's absolutely defined. That definition is expressed in um, the fact that it's from the center of the thickness of the door to the back set. The back set is the center of the thickness of the door to the hole, to whatever you're, you're putting there. It could be, you know, you know, the back set could be how far over you're going to set the Dutch door bolt uh, on the top leaf of a Dutch door so that the factory knows where to reinforce the door for. It doesn't have to be a hole. Um, the center of the thickness. And what's nice about that definition is we now no longer care how thick the door is. So you can understand that if we had a beveled edge door that was three inch thick, where you're going to put, where you're going to define back set from the low or the high side is going to very much depend on how thick the door is. So what they call it is one eighth in two. So what that means is for every two inch in door thickness, there's a one eighth of an inch bevel. Okay. So if this door was fictionally two inch thick, the distance between here, and if I drew a dimension line, that distance right there is one eighth of an inch. Now you can understand, if you have a square edge door, you can put your tape measure on either side, it doesn't matter. But when you have a beveled edge door, or you have a radius edge door, or you have a rabbited door, you do need to understand how they're defining back set because that's going to very much determine where the hole is actually located. So what's really elegant about their template is if you're putting it on the low bevel, which is going to always be the push side, or if you're putting it on the high bevel, if there is a bevel, which is always going to be the pull side, um, you'll notice the distance between those two lines and they are depending on your door thickness being inch and three quarter naturally. Um, you know, and, it, and if your door is not inch and three quarter, then those lines are not going to work. Um, and I don't see anywhere on here where it states inch and three quarter door thickness assumed. But um, yeah, it, it's possible you're going to put this onto a, a two and a quarter inch thick door. It's very possible you're going to need different parts because the lock is not engineered to go past um, it's for an inch and three quarter thick door only they actually in fact may not have parts to allow you to go onto a thicker door which is why their template is inch and three quarter only so the distance between those high bevel and low bevel is going to be that one eighth of an inch but not quite one eighth it would be some tiny decimal point smaller than that okay so that's why it's really important to understand where you're marking back set from because these holes are really critical to get in the right place. If you have a square edge door, you have no worries. If it's a, if it's a beveled edge door, you have to say to yourself, where am I prepping it on, uh, on the door? If you're on the high side, you need to compensate for that. You need to give a little bit more. You like go to 2 and 13 sixteenths, just less. Or you go to like 2 and 11 sixteenths, just less. Um, if you're on the low side, so be mindful. People will drill through the door. They're measuring on one side, and they, and it, and it's, and it's 
it's not okay on, on it doesn't work on the side they just drilled and they scratch their head and say why why are my holes not in alignment and then on the opposite side of the door they're off as well how did i make a mistake then you start to study it and say darn it that door is beveled what am i missing well what you're missing is the fact that bevel is uh, back set is defined from that point is what the missing information is okay now um, the only other thing on the template to discuss is the strike preparation. Um, I'm looking at the strike preparation and not fully understanding what they're wanting here by the by the um, two circle shapes. Um, so the bottom line is this strike is going to be inch and a quarter wide up here. It's going to be four and seven eighths tall here. Its overall is going to be whatever it is, inch and thirteen six. Uh, pardon me, inch and uh, yeah, inch and thirteen sixteenths. Strikes are measured from the center line of the screw hole to the edge of the lip. So this strike would be called whatever that is, inch and a quarter. This is an inch and a quarter strike, is what it would be called. Um, inch and a quarter. Four and seven eighths. I got three and eleven sixteenths. Okay, I, I didn't measure that. That's no problem. They want you to inch and an eighth deep, one inch wide, three and eleven sixteenths. I said that wrong. This is three and three eighths. I said that wrong. The lip height is three and three eighths. They want three and eleven sixteenths, one inch wide, inch and an eighth deep. That is going to permit you to get that dust box installed. You're always going to want the dust box installed on your installation. If it is an interior application where you have a steel drywall frame, there are no mortar boxes on the back side of a drywall style frame. Um, you're going to want to prevent the encroachment of particulate coming through the wall. And as I was just uh, had the uh, good fortune of sitting in a class with an exceptionally talented architectural hardware consultant who brought up the fact that the 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 core from drywall as it creeps in from the back side of the strike without your dust box gets into the lock work itself and has seen the degradation or the premature death of hardware as a result of not preventing that particulate and I had said earlier in this video how that mineral core really just will wreak havoc on your tools um, you're gonna want to have that there for that reason um, they don't call it out in the installation instructions, but we're going to talk about those next, um, they, although they might. Now, if you're dealing with masonry type frames, they have mortar guards, mortar boxes behind them, behind the strikes and the hinges, and you can absolutely use a mortar guard as your dust box. That's going to be perfectly acceptable. You're not going to bust off that mortar box and then chip out the masonry behind it to install a plastic dust box. Save these um, if you have them, if you ever think you're going to work on locks again, because if you had to buy them, they're not, they're not actually inexpensive. <clears throat> now, uh, and speaking of mortar boxes, if you're going to do any preparation into a steel frame after it's been set in a masonry wall, you're going to want to cover up those areas. Even if you have to go in and drill and tap holes, put in some white styrofoam insulation. Hold it on with duct tape so that the ma you can set the frame in place, the mason can come and trowel the mortar on the courses as they're going up, but will keep that area free for you to be able to go in and drill and tap your holes. Why? Well, if you're going to put on a continuous hinge and you have not preserved a space for you behind the mortar, it's going to become a one hour, a one hour job is going to become a four hour job for sure. Um, anything that you're going to prep cover it up uh, before the mason uh, installs the frame. So that covers the, the template in total, uh, is just the bottom line. Now we're at the installation guide, and we're just going to go down to the bottom of page two. That's there, because we're doing sectional trim. And one thing that I always uh, do is I lay out all the parts. I look at the parts list, and I make sure that we actually have everything. We know that we have the two rows, as I've already shown that. We 
we know that we have the two mounting posts. Wait a minute, mounting posts. Those are spindles I just showed you. Mounting posts are part number two. We know that we have our mounting posts. They're here. Lever assembly outside left, we have that. The cylinder we know we have. The cylinder spring and collar, I know we have those because I showed those to you. There is a, a, um, a cylinder spring, this black spring that's here. It's wavy like that. Uh, we actually call it a wave washer. That's what it's actually known as. So that when you install your cylinder into it, you can continue to tighten the cylinder down and it will then keep that collar tight on the face of the door so that it doesn't rattle and get your cylinder to the proper vertical orientation so you can remove the screw. And that's what makes that really handy to be able to make that work. You don't want to install it, your lock without a wave washer. Um, you can, of course, but you can expect your collar to be, uh, to be loose on the door. These collars are uh, some serious pieces of material in terms of what they're made of. Generally, you'll find this material not made of a soft material. I expect this to be... Um, it's marginally magnetic. I would be very tempted to say that this is stainless steel because stainless does pick up some magnetic properties. I think the term is passivated. If the stainless is not passivated, there will be residual magnetism. The point of this collar being a, hard, uh, being a durable piece of ma base material and it being tapered is, and it thoroughly concealing the head of the cylinder. You can't see the head of the cylinder when you're properly installed. And that's all by design because, I'll put the wave washer on there. So when I get that tightened down, the wave washer is in there, you're not gonna see the head of that cylinder. It's gonna be flush. That's intentional. That's to prevent you from getting a crescent wrench or a pipe wrench, not a crescent wrench, but a, a pipe wrench, onto the head of the cylinder and being able to easily defeat the, defeat the lock. What breaks in that condition is the set screws that you tighten through here. They are going to rest or nest into the groove in the side of the cylinder. What you'll do is you can certainly wrench that off because this is made of brass soft you'll either break the screw or you or you will severely score and um, you'll severely score and likely destroy the cylinder um, but when you can't get to the head of the cylinder this is tapered and the fact that this will rotate on the door because it will spin underneath the head of the cylinder all of that conspires to give you an, an anti you know, threat sort of uh, provision on the head of a cylinder. It's not particular to town steel. That's just how mortise cylinders are installed. So it's very typical type of installation. So we know that we have part five, part six, lever assembly inside left. We know we have that. The thumb turn, the thumb turn screws. We know we have the thumb turn. The thumb turn screws, I hope, are buried inside this box. Yeah, they are. They're in there. So we're making sure that we have everything. Assembly mounting screws, part 10. Part 10. I'm sorry, I'm... St oh, there it is. Okay, so, yeah, part 10 is going to be the assembly mounting screws. That's going to be these two screws. Those are definitely included. Spindle, there should be two of those. Those we definitely have. They say that there's one spindle. Oh, I see what's happening here. Okay, so yeah, there, there is indeed one spindle. Um, this is what's called a swivel spindle. You thread that together. Okay, and what that, what if I threaded it all the way, what this system would allow is one lever to be rigid and that the other lever would still rotate. Now, if you have a function where both levers are going to be rigid when the lock is locked, you could use a solid spindle, but you'll require a swivel spindle when you have a function that gives you rigid trim on one side while active trim on the other. Okay. Or if you have a situation where there's only one uh, trim, 
well then you have an additional piece of hardware that will allow you to install this the mortise body goes into the door then you'll take your spindle and stick it in and through towards the side that will have the trim and then you'll tighten it down uh, with that additional piece of equipment uh, so we have our spindle we know we have our faceplate screws do we yes they're here these are called part 12 i imagine yeah two tiny little 832 flat undercut head screws those are there Face plate, we know we have the armor front. Mortise lock case mounting screw, part 14. Those are going to be some big honking screws. Um, they give us four. I've got some. Oh, I know what it is. Um, they give us two screws to attach the lock body, two screws for the strike. Okay. After that, you're going to have. Well, they also give you. Um, two machine screws if you're putting that strike or the lock body down to a metal door so it can go either way in that regard. Your strike of course is included. Then there are these two small screws that I don't know what these are for. They look like they're for the thumb turn but the thumb turn has its own screws and I don't see anywhere else where I've missed these. So those are a mystery to me. But here's the good news. We have all the screws we're supposed to have. Okay. The lock installation is literally as simple as can be. You're going to notice the lock case goes in. What I like to do when I install the lock case is I will dry fit it. I will hold it in the door and I'm going to make sure visually that everything lines up where it absolutely needs to line up that I can see a nice margin around the cylinder hole, that I can see that I can get the thumb turn installed and it operate correctly, and that my knob or my spindle hole and then my through bolt holes are healthy, meaning I can actually pass the trim, the inner mechanisms of that material through those holes so that I will have an operating condition. If I'm not sure of it, I put that lock body in and then I will then tighten it in, just the lock body. Then I'm going to attach my trim and make sure that everything functions and especially when I rotate the lever and I let it go, it needs to snap back up. If something is bound or too tight, that lever will very often be held in a condition where it doesn't return back up. Um, over tightening a mortise lock is not good. You, you could actually over tighten your screws through your trim so tight that the lock body will literally not work correctly. It will bind. It will be hard to retract the latch and, and it won't come back up. So dry fit, if you're not sure, make any adjustments necessary to your holes and be mindful of how big your rosettes are and how much you can enlarge in a hole if, enlarge a hole if you need to. Um, this lock here that they're showing us is a left hand. So your installation will be exactly opposite of this. Uh, but you'll notice a couple of things. The spindle portion with the thread, that goes on the inside. You're going to want that on the uh, on the interior of the door. Should you need to get to it, you can. Okay. Uh, and speaking more truism about that, you have your outside mounting bolts and then your inside mounting screws. Well, that's what you want on the outside because what you want to present to the exterior world if they were to peel that rose off is just that you don't want to have that Phillips head that's just going to allow them to remove the trim and then easily with a simple tool be able to pull the latch bolt back um, and your installation is so simple based on this drawing that I don't see a reason to further uh, beleaguer the point because I don't also see any other reasons any other thing based on my experience that needs to be called out uh, the screws, the number 12 screws, those are unusual screws. You don't want to lose those. That's an 832 screw, but it's a flat undercut head, meaning that it's flat underneath here. Okay. But flat undercut head means that it, it, is a under, it is a flat head, so it requires a countersink, but it's flat underneath, and that it permits you to get the head flush of the screw through a very thin base material. And that armor front, of course, is quite thin. If you were to have a, you know, a, a screw that was not countersunk, pardon me, that was not flathead, forgive me, that was not undercut head, you'd never be able to get that flush with the edge of the plate, okay? Now, just to go through the steps 
Uh, prepare door per the template, step one, we've done that. Insert lock case into the mortise cutout and fasten the door with screws, item 14, we've talked about that. Step three, insert inside and outside spindles on, into through the lock case and tighten the screw, we've talked about that. Step four, insert two mounting posts, item two, into the outside lever. Press rows onto the outside lever of assembly. That will permit you to keep those screws captive so that they're not going to poke out through you. You don't have to do it that way right now, but they're saying go ahead and do it. I personally would probably not do it because um, I don't want to peel that rose off in case I needed to remove the door, the, the trim from the, from the door. Uh, step six, position outside lever assembly onto the mortise lock case and line up the spindle and mounting posts with the mortise lock uh, case. Position the inside lever assembly onto the mortise lock case, line up the spindles. Step eight, using the two mounting screws, item 10. Item 10, I had trouble finding that the first time. Oh, there they are, of course. Item 10. Fasten the inside lever assembly to the outside lever assembly. So those item 10 screws are going to go into the mounting posts, which are threaded on the inside. Uh, press the rows onto the inside lever assembly. I might make sure everything works before I did that. Optional, screw in cylinder using the spring and collar. If you have a cylinder, you'll do that as well. Thread cylinder, okay, thread cylinder to the operational depth and secure with mortise lock case set screw. Um, you've not put your armor front on yet, and that's what they're talking about, your set screws. There's, there's two of them because you could put a cylinder on this side or on this, or on this side. Oh, or on this side, okay? Fasten the faceplate, which is an armor front, using the two flat undercut head screws. Install your thumb turn if required. Um, when you position the thumb turn on the door, you can position that so the holes are at 12 and 6 or at, you know, 9 and 3. Um, horizontal is how you'll normally see them. Um, you're welcome to install it either way. Um, if you normally have the door in the locked position when you're there, you might want to make it so that when it's thrown, you're covering the screws. Just, you know, just to be, uh, I guess, a bit, you know, tedious about it. Install the thumb turn. Always check operation of lock set prior to locking and shutting the door uh, to change handing reverse inside and outside lever assemblies and change mortise lock case handing. We went over that earlier. So the bottom line is it's a super duper handy uh, lock. I believe that it is uh, a quality piece of hardware, especially for the cost. Uh, it's a confluence of value, uh, cost and quality, I think, from Townline. And that brings this video to a conclusion. There is a link below this video to the manufacturer's page where you can pull up not only all of the Townline products that we sell, but also a link to the manufacturer's website as well as a link to the full product catalog uh, that's there. I um, don't do a lot of Townline work, and I just think that's possibly a failure on my part of marketing, I suppose. They are an imported lock. There are lots of options when it comes to imported locks. And as a result, I, uh, there's lots of options. So what they need to do is differentiate themselves in the realm of imported locks. And how they do so is ligature-resistant trim. Townline uh, became, was presented to me initially because of their ligature-resistant. So if you're working in a psychiatric sort of application, you might want to look at their ligature resistant options because that's how Townline was really first introduced to me because they had several and many options available to the uh, potential buyer. If you have any questions on the Townline, this is their part number, I've already forgotten. Their MSS-L08 in a Tango lever and a stainless steel finish or any other Townline product, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you.